Hi all, Retro Tech Chris here again. Welcome back to the channel. We're glad you're here. So today, we're gonna have a look at my Compaq Presario 2100 and the journey it took to get it here. Yes, there is a story behind this PC. What I'm gonna show you is some of the hardware associated with this ultra-budget PC based upon the Cyrex Media GX processor. I'll show you the hardware, and then I'll show you the installation procedure for Windows 95 because due to limitations of this machine, you can't just install Windows 95 or 98 by putting a CD in the drive. There's actually a bug in the system where that won't work. So we'll show you what that setup process looks like. We'll go ahead and take it to that point, and then I'll give you my final thoughts. So without further ado, let's go. So the acquisition started with a post in a Dallas-Fort Worth retro computing group with this picture you see here. And I commented that this is something that is definitely worth grabbing and talked a little bit about the Packard Bell Legend Supreme system that I had. And then from there, the individual said they'd go ahead and grab it as you can see. And I said that someone will definitely take it. So I bought the system. And from there, I needed a way to pick it up. But as it ends up, I knew that at some point in the future, I'd be going to a Dallas-Fort Worth retro meetup. So here you can see us headed to the meetup. And indeed, during that time that I was in Dallas, I did pick this up from the obsolete geek who was so kind to hold it for me. Next, let's have a look at the hardware. Here you can see that nice shiny monitor and me in the reflection. <laughs> and this is a very cool system. Look at the size of the monitor compared to the system itself. So this system is based upon the Cyrex Media GX 133 MHz processor. And although it really is technically Pentium class, it really performs more like a 486. Here's the back of the monitor if you're interested as to what that looks like. The monitor is non-functional, unfortunately. We'll also do a close-up on the sticker so you can see what that looks like, including the manufacturing information of December 96. Next up we have the mouse, and it's a basic mouse, but a nice compact black mouse, if you will, a PS2 two-button mouse. And next we have the keyboard. And trust me when I say it's nothing spectacular, but it has a decent tactile feel to it, but it's nothing to write home about. Here we can see the back of it, and we'll do a nice close-up of the label so that we can see what that looks like too. There you have it. I love how it has a compact spare part number on it like most compact devices do. Here we have a close-up of the front of the unit. I love those speakers and they are quite good actually. But you can see the floppy and CD-ROM drive as well as the sleep button and some volume buttons. And here we'll pan around just a little bit so you can see the front of the unit in all of its glory. That CD-ROM drive is just so perfectly set in the center which is so nice. Here we can see the back of the unit with the modem, the PS2 keyboard and mouse, monitor, game port, serial, parallel, sound, microphone, and that power button and power connector on the back. Notice how it's a physical power button. From here we can go ahead and take the unit apart. It's just these three screws in the back here, and the case will pop off, so we'll get the third one out there. And we can go ahead and give that case a little shove and we can start to have a look at what is inside of this very compact and budget machine. And here we get to have a first look inside. You can see all of those components nice and compact in there. We have that big subwoofer, I guess it is, speaker over there on the top. And next to it is a five and a quarter inch quantum Bigfoot drive. What a deal that is, pretty crazy. And look at this little power supply. Since it is touch electronics, I felt I needed to touch it. And here we have a modem and an 8-bit ISA slot, but not just any 8-bit ISA slot. Look at how that's connected. That's right, just one screw on the outside and the modem pokes through. How odd is that? It's definitely a little bit different. Here we can take that one screw out so we can have a closer look at the modem. And as we look at it, we can see a Lucent chip on there, as well as a lot of resistors, and it is a compact branded modem, of course. And there we have our line connection as well, and our stickers and spare part numbers and all of that good stuff on the back. So with just two screws, we can actually undo the front of the computer so that it will slide out. At which point, we can have a much closer look at all of the components that are inside. This definitely makes it easier. So I've taken those two screws out, and then from there, we can slide things out a little bit and start to undo all of the cables. I'll start by disconnecting my CF to IDE adapter, 
I do use that just to preserve the Quantum Bigfoot drive because they do have a relatively high rate of failure. With that out, we can disconnect the CD-ROM and we can disconnect the floppy drive and basically disconnect any sort of power or other things that lead into those so that we can take things apart. And I just kind of work my way along disconnecting things. I know where everything goes. Luckily, pretty much everything only goes in one place as it is permitted. I do have to show you this very short IDE cable though. Isn't that interesting? Not a surprise given the small form factor of the case. And with that, we can also disconnect the left speaker that you see me disconnecting there. And there's some other things that need disconnected as well, like the CD-ROM audio cable. We'll actually need to disconnect that from both ends. And we'll go ahead and give this a little tug and I'll soon discover that. <laughs> and I'll have that all disconnected. I also disconnected the front panel on the other speaker. So now we get our first look at the motherboard with everything out of view. And this is kind of cool. We do have this SMC based chipset that we see here in the front of the machine. And we also have this Cyrex chipset here for supporting everything else. And we have four 72 pin SIMs that you see here, as well as a clock battery and a one power connector for the system. That's all we have for this. Here we can see connections for the floppy drive and IDE and a pad for a second IDE, though there isn't one on this particular system. And moving along, we have the BIOS chip here, just a little chip there, pretty standard. Over here, we have a little analog devices, digital to audio converter. And we have a CD in for our CD sound as well. We also have our right speaker connector and our front panel connector. And we have our left speaker connector you see here. Now, the next thing I wanted to do is take out the processor. Look at how the heat sink is affixed to the board. It's via those four clips you saw there. So here we can go ahead and undo those clips. I'm using a pair of needle nose pliers. I want to be gentle because that's pretty much right on the circuit board. And we are able to free the heat sink from the processor. And underneath we can see we have this Cyrex Media GX 133 BP chip. Copyright 1995 Cyrex USA. And right beneath Cyrex USA, we have the word Canada. I don't know, I have so many questions, but that's the way it is. All kidding aside, the Media GX is really an interesting piece of tech. When paired together with that CX5510 chip that we saw just a minute ago, this chip serves as a PCI interface, performs graphics and audio functions, as well as SD-RAM functions. Really, that's a lot to expect from a processor, and it's pretty cool that it's integrated. That said, there's no level 2 cache on this chip, so that's something to be aware of. So let me go ahead and get this heatsink reattached. It's a matter of pushing it in place and you can just use finger pressure to push it in and get it where it needs to be. Of course, you want to be gentle. So now we can get a look at the front of the system here and I'll go ahead and take out that Quantum Bigfoot drive so that we can have a closer look at it. So four screws and we can go ahead and slide it out and have a look at it. There it is in all of its glory. And there you can see it. I'll go ahead and flip it around so that you can see the label here. We'll get a nice close up on it so that you can see what that looks like. There it is, a Quantum Bigfoot five and a quarter inch series drive. Next up, I'll go ahead and take the floppy drive out so you can see me going through and doing that here, just four screws. I do have the machine turned up on its side, as you can see. So I'll go ahead and grab that out. And it is a floppy drive without a face because, well, as you see, this does have its own kind of faceplate entry on the front of the machine. So there you can see the drive and the cable associated with the drive. Nothing spectacular in NEC FD123IT. There you have it. So at this point, we've pretty much seen everything. I'll go ahead and put this back together. First, the floppy drive goes in, and then that Quantum Bigfoot drive goes back in. Four screws, and we will be all in business there. Get that where it needs to be once again. And I'll proceed to speed through the rest of the assembly here so you can watch it as a nice, soothing assembly process. Here we are putting in the motherboard with its six or so screws to reattach it to the base. So that'll go in there. And then we have to actually flip it around and we can put our fan back in with two screws here, as well as putting in all of the connector screws for the various ports. So you can see me putting these in here nice and quick since this is done in a sped up mode. As you can see, put the modem back in as well and put a screw in for that. Then we'll put the front of the system back together, plug in our cables and we're almost done. Need to plug in the CD-ROM drive, need to really see what I'm doing. Unfortunately, we did have one small casualty in the form of a Molex connector that broke. 
Fortunately, I had this floppy mounting kit around and I was able to steal a connector from it and I ordered some more to replace the mounter from that kit. So next up, we'll go ahead and finish putting in the rest of the cables so we can get this machine back together and power it on. Ah, so nice to slide everything back together and put in those two screws to hold everything back together in the chassis. Put my CF card back in with that nice new power connector and viola. We're all set. Time to put the cover back on and then we can power this thing back up and see what things look like. Three final screws in the back just to keep everything nice and secure. I'll even put it all back together before I do a power on test. I'm sure that everything will be just fine. We will see here momentarily. Now something else we didn't really talk about and I didn't show you during the disassembly is that this machine came with the front cover broken off. And I did try to glue back together the little tiny plastic pieces, use some super glue, and that didn't work out. But I did devise a method to make this machine hold together. And as you can see here, that involved using duct tape around the CD-ROM drive so that it could hold the front faceplate together. Then I put the CD-ROM in place and was able to secure the front of the machine to the rest of the system. That said, that does mean that that front panel is now not removable easily, but at least the machine now stays together. So with the machine all back together, let's go ahead and have a listen as we power it up and let it go through its power on sequence. For the setup process, in case somebody else needs this exact procedure, it is available in my Git repository. And I will put a link in the video description below. So the first thing we're going to do is download Media GX drivers. We're going to go to the thread that you see here. Trust me, it's fine, and I'm so grateful that somebody put it here. So we can go ahead and download that Media GX file. I think you have to be a member of Vogons in order to get that, so you may need to join. From there, we can launch the executable and press the left button. Trust me, it's fine. And then from there, we can navigate to the Media GX and the Win9x directory that you see in here and copy out those certified drivers that you see there. I'll drag them out to the desktop for just a second. And then we'll go ahead and navigate back just a few steps and get rid of the installers that we don't need. And we can drag that in. That way we can keep things nice and concise. So next, we're gonna download modem drivers and these are impossible to find. So I grabbed them off of the Bigfoot drive and put them in my Git repository so that you can download them if you need them, you are welcome. Let's go ahead and unzip the contents of the download so that we can then have that available for installation later. And I'll delete the zip file because we won't need it anymore. There we go. So next up, we're going to perform the installation and we're going to install onto a media card. You'll want to follow my procedure on how to set up a CF card using VirtualBox, and there is a video for that as well. So let's go ahead and launch VirtualBox as administrator, which is the final step in the procedure, more or less. And from there, we can go ahead and power on a DOS image, as you see here. And at this point, we need a boot disk, so I'll go ahead and put a disk image into the drive. I'm going to put a Windows 95B boot disk into the drive so that we can install a FAT32 partition. So with that, let me get my windows nice and organized so that you can actually see what we're doing here. And we'll go ahead and restart that virtual machine. And from here, it's your standard startup and order of operations. You're going to need to do FDisk to create a partition on the disk. So that's the first thing we'll do, and we'll use the maximum size for the disk, creating a primary partition and setting it active. So that'll go ahead and complete, and then we can reboot and format the drive. There we have it. Now it's time to go ahead and reboot. So we'll do our reboot here and we can format the drive by doing a format C colon slash S to make that drive bootable. There we go, typing that in. And from there, the drive will proceed to format as one would expect. So with that complete, we're going to eject the disk from the drive and we will close the virtual machine. And we actually need to close all of VirtualBox to release the lock on the CF card. Perfect. So now from there, we can go ahead and start to perform those actions. So let's go ahead and minimize things here and let's navigate to that CF card, which happens to be drive H on my system. And from here, we can drag over some installers. So I'll drag over that Cyrex Media GX installer. 
to drive H as you see here. And we'll go ahead and let that copy. It'll take just a second and we'll be all set. I also dragged over the modem drivers and then we will also drag over the Windows 95 installer as you see there. Now we're all set. At this point, we need to start up in exclusive mode. So we do talk about that in the procedure. I'll go ahead and start up a DOS prompt in administrator mode and we can run the exclusive command so that we can lock that CF card and hide it from the operating system. So let's go ahead and get situated there and we can get all set, make the window a decent size and we can go to the VirtualBox directory and then we can launch exclusive. So we'll go ahead and launch that. Under my downloads directory, we can type exclusive accordingly. There we go. Once I find it, the disk ACL folder that is, use exclusive and we need to specify the drive that we want to lock. I think that's drive H. And then from there, we can go ahead and specify we want to run virtualbox.exe. Now that CF card is locked. Again, this is all covered in my procedure on setting up a retro PC using a CF card. Okay, with that, we can go ahead and power on the virtual machine. And now we can start the installation process and we do need to start the first stage of the installation process in the virtual machine. It will not work if started on the Compaq. So we'll get our windows situated here and go to town. So at this point, it's just the standard Windows 95 installation. We can change into the Windows 95 directory if I ever get that right and start setup and let it do its thing. It may complain about scan disk, then again, it may not. We'll just continue on and proceed through the Windows 95 setup process, agreeing to the various options and just doing a standard install as you can see here. And I skipped a couple of files because I don't install AOL or any of those other old internet browsers. From there, once we get to this finishing setup prompt, we can go ahead and turn off the virtual machine and remove the CF card and put it in the compact. That's right, the initial stage of 95 installation is now complete. So we'll go ahead and switch over to the compact and finish out the rest of 95 installation per the typical lightning round 95 installation you see here. Internet Explorer will spin and do its thing for a while. Eventually we get a desktop. Now we can start to have some fun and install some drivers. So we'll go ahead and navigate to drive C and we can first have a look at the first thing we want to install, which is going to be the Media GX certified drivers. So for here, it's just gonna be click finish and let it do its thing. It'll go ahead and unpack. It'll do its installation and go through a variety of prompts as we are about to see. So when we get to this point here, we can just click next and move right along and then yes, and then from there, we can hit next again. The defaults are fine. We can do a custom install because why not? I always do when given the choice. I'm going to uncheck audio drivers because the audio drivers are actually bad and make things very crackly as you move around. From there, we restart and we're back at the desktop again, ready to do some more work. So with the reboot complete, we can now go to control panel via start settings and we can go and run the add new hardware wizard to detect all of those things that were added as a function of the chipset drivers being installed. So we'll just say yes there and then next and let Windows do its detection thing till its heart is content. And we'll see what sort of things got found if we look at details, all kinds of things, including a sound card. Cool. So from there we can click finish and different things will be pulled from the Windows installation. We restart multiple restarts as new devices are detected. At some point, we're gonna to get to a point where we need to install our modem drivers. From there, we can just browse to the directory on drive C where we have those modem drivers and it will pick them up and install them. And this will be when it prompts you to pick something when it can't find drivers. Here we can see it installing it and our compact 336 modem will be all set. When you get the attcom.vxd, you may have to do some browsing around, which is a little bit annoying, but go to the compact drivers directory and that will be found for the modem. Okay, so from there we can click finish and we have a nice functional modem installed. Not sure if you'll ever use it, but you now have that nice option. From here, let's go to work on the display. So we can go back to control panel and add new hardware, but we're going to do something a little bit different. Click next, but then select no. And then from there, we can go down and find display adapters and click next and we get to actually do a have disk so that we can navigate to a special location and find those drivers. So we can do a browse and then go to program files and then to the Cyrex installation and then click OK. And it will find the Media GX video drivers. Click OK to choose it. And then from there, we can hit next. This adds the driver into the registry of drivers available for the system. 
It doesn't necessarily install the driver, but it's now available for our use. So from here, we can right click on my computer, go to properties, go to device manager. From here, we can find the display adapter, which is a little bit higher up than where I went. Click on the standard display adapter, click on driver, then click on update driver, and then click on no. And then from there, we'll click next. And now we can navigate by showing all hardware and we can navigate down to the Cyrex Corporation location and choose that Express Graphics selection. It's going to ask for the driver's disk again. Just browse to C drive and then program files and then down to that Cyrex directory again. Click OK so it finds it, then OK again, and it will now be installed. What a pain. Go ahead and restart. And now finally we have deeper color resolution and we can even bump up the display resolution if so desired if you like something more than 640 by 480, which I typically do. So we'll bump up accordingly and get nice high color at 1024 by 768. I won't specify a monitor and we'll apply the settings without restart. And there you have it, a higher resolution. How nice is that? Very cool. So with that complete, we have just one more thing to do. We can go to my computer and properties, go to device manager, delete both Cyrex PCI bus indicators that you see there as devices and then from there we're going to reboot so i got one deleted we'll go ahead and delete the other and on reboot it will get detected and we will have no yellow exclamation points which is my definition of success for system setup there we can see all kinds of great things get detected from there we can go to my computer then we can go to properties and then we can go to device manager and we'll see tons of goodness no exclamation points that's perfect Okay, well, that's what I had for you today. Hope you enjoyed it. We had a lot of fun tearing this machine apart and seeing all of its intricacies. Definitely subscribe to the channel. There's more content on the way. Ring that notification bell and you'll be notified when new videos are posted. And if you liked what you saw today, please give me a thumbs up. I really appreciate it. But in all cases, that's what I have for you today. Thanks once again for joining me for the retro journey. And I look forward to seeing you next time. But until then, bye for now.